Carla and Amanda, where we talk about books and the literary world. Then we'll visit the past with things from our childhood. There may be a rant or two, but we promise you laughs and a good time. Okay, welcome to our first podcast of Out of the Stacks. My name is Amanda. And I'm Carla. And we are starting this podcast because we want to, but we also have reasons why we think we're going to be good at this. Um, Carla, what are some of your qualifications and why do you want to do this podcast? Well, we both worked at libraries. Yes. I currently work at a library. I run a book club, YA for Adults, where yeah. a bunch of grown women sit around and talk about Young adult books. Yeah, <laughs> and, book and then, uh, yeah, you come. And then we always, like, devolve into this discussion about, like, whatever. And, and we, <laughs> I don't know, we feel like we have something to say. We feel like we have something to share. We have our own opinions. And, you know, we've been working in libraries, become familiar with young adult books, the young adult book world, yeah. and libraries in general. And, and so, I don't know, but that's kind of it for me. Like, I just... I. I feel like I want to talk about some stuff. And I just love doing podcasts, and I worked in the library 17 years, worked in circulation, and, Mm -hmm. you know, children's, and then with reference, and so books have been a major part of my life, not just Mm -hmm. in the work world, but, you know, I always was reading, and so, and I like the YA book club, and I really enjoy Mm -hmm. young adults, so we always have really good discussion, like you said, we always devolve into something more, something new. Else, uh-huh. you know, yeah. part of society and culture, uh-huh. and so you know, we thought it'd just be a really good idea to do this little podcast, and yeah. so we'll see how it's gonna go. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna do this in parts. We're gonna kind of do a literary podcast. We're gonna talk about books and authors and things in the literary world that are happening. We'll do book reviews or if we have a special one that we really love or even hate it in our YA book club, mm-hmm. maybe we'll talk about that. So Better to talk about stuff when you hate it. Yeah, it is. <laughs> There's so much more to talk about. Yeah. And then we'll devolve into childhood memories, childhood games, toys, mm-hmm. shows, and then we'll have a section, we're going to end this section with rantings and ravings. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to express our opinions because we care. Exactly. Okay, so our first part, we're going to do, like I said, literary, book reviews. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you wanting to talk about this podcast? I want to talk about one of my favorite YA authors kind of right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like not a lot of people know about her. Her name is Ruta Sepetis. Yeah, I don't... I don't yeah. recognize her, so. She's, so, her first book was Between Shades of Grey, and it kind of came out at the, at the same time as Fifty Shades of Grey. Ooh, okay. And so maybe that didn't help her so well. No, um, yeah. But she, so she's kind of an interesting person. She's, I think, like, mostly Lithuanian, or oh, okay. I believe that's where her family is from. I'm trying to find some information here on her. And she writes these books that are historical fiction, but are like really well researched parts of history that you've never heard about. Oh, that so, sounds right up my alley. Yeah. Oh, fiction. they're so good. So, Between Shades of Grey is um, a 15 year old girl in Lithuania in World War II. And she and her family are taken to Siberia to a work camp. Oh, okay. And it's because of you know the Russian involvement in the war and Lithuania being so close to Russia and like it's a part of, of World War II that I don't think we're as aware of because yeah. you know we hear about Japan and Germany and yeah. you know Russia like Russia was involved but didn't really know that much about them at the time and so these they took these people to Siberia and like treated them really really terribly and it's so this book is like super depressing but it's so good it's so well researched it makes makes you want to know more and then she wrote another book kind of with characters that are related to the characters from between shades of gray it's called salt to the sea and it again takes place in that same kind of area lithuania but it's about these different people who are trying to get to the baltic sea to get on a ship to flee because the German army is falling, and they they have to get away. And it's it's the greatest 
tragedy in maritime history that this it was a German cruise liner was going to take all these people away and it was sunk oh. by a submarine and it like 10,000 passengers were on there and like most of them died 9,000 people died oh wow and the ship was only supposed to hold like 1,800 people so yeah. it's again like this really well researched book that's just so good but it's about this part of history that we're not aware of and at the same time it's depressing yeah and then her most yeah her most recent one um is about spain when they were under dictatorship um so again like something that you're like really i don't really want to read this but it's really good really Really good so ruta sapetti's try her she's written four books it takes her a while but they're so good okay if they take a while as long as it's good then yeah it's worth it they're forgiven for taking yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about um, the book, The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek. Mm. It's The author is Kim Michelle Richardson. It's a story about, her name is Cussie Carter, and her position in the WPA during the Great Depression. In Kentucky, the government hired women to go on horseback or donkeys, to ride donkeys through the mountains, mm-hmm. and deliver these books to people, to schools, and to these various areas. And also, what is, what is cussy is what is termed a blue person of Kentucky. There are generations of Kentuckians uh, during that time who had a blue tint to their skin because of a disorder called mesoglobinemia. Mesoglobinemia, which is where their blood doesn't oxygenate right. That's crazy. So it's not red like normal uh-huh. blood, and which gives you this pink tone to your skin skin uh-huh. so they're the blue people and it's the wpa the horse riders the mm-hmm. librarians book women and the blue people are both true facts about kentucky so takes these true stories and these true facts and weaves the story about cussie and mm-hmm. the different people she meets on her path and how she affects their life and how they affect hers and it's just really a wonderful book mm-hmm. you know it's a quick read and it's very powerful and has a big impact and so you just learn about Cussie's strength in trying yeah. to be a blue person because the blue people were thought uh, even lower than African Americans in society and so if you can imagine Kentucky in the 1930s and lower than African Americans that's they were really really looked down upon so she mm-hmm. struggles with that and yeah. but she really enjoys her route and the people on her route so it's really a great book the, tru- the Book Woman of Troublesome Creek, yeah. I recommended it. I, I listened to the audio of it, and it's like like the original outreach librarians. Yeah. Yeah, now we have a bookmobile that yeah. goes around town and yeah. to those places that are underserved by a library. But it's, it's very interesting to me that in the 1930s, like getting books and other materials to people was so important. And like I said, she makes a huge, huge impact on the people on her route. Mm-hmm. She visits the school, the school kids always love her, mm-hmm. you know, they just enjoy the time that she goes to drop off the books. She's also kind of like checking in on the health of the people, because yeah. these people are so remote. She tells the doctor like, if certain people need care. Yeah. So it's it's really a lot more than just delivering books. So it's a good book, and I recommend it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I've recommended it to a couple people, and they seem to enjoy it too. So that's yep. my recommendation. Cool. Um, that's our literary part. We're going yeah. to now talk or devolve, that's <laughs> where we're going to put it, um, into childhood things that we have brought up several times in the book club, which is Polly Pocket. Yeah. Carla and I are both older millennials, <laughs> you know, yeah. we're in our 30s, so these Polly Pockets we played with as kids, and for some reason it just was, it keeps getting brought, brought up, I don't I don't know, know why. I don't remember how it came up at first, and one of the girls in our book club, who's a little younger, like in her 20s, said that she had this whole, like, village of Harry Potter Polly Pockets, yeah. which I didn't know was a thing, because when you and I had Polly Pockets, they weren't any, like, characters, they weren't, you know, there weren't Disney Polly Pockets, yeah. which there were later on, like, it was just Polly and her friends. Yeah. and these just generic characters and apparently it became like this huge thing and so I'm really jealous of this Harry Potter Polly Pocket too. village and I hope she lets us see it and try to get her to like display it at the library yeah. or something so <laughs> I had a wedding chapel and I thought that was just so cool because it lit up 
like you had to put a AAA battery in it. Oh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. And then you pressed the cross on the steeple or something, mm-hmm. and that turned the light on. It was like this teeny tiny little light, right. but like barely, like it barely shone. Yeah. <laughs> it was like pretty weak, but it was so cool. My sister was the really big Polly Pocket girl, and we yeah. have some of her old ones here. We have one that's like a castle, and we have one that's a garden. Would say one's a bedroom and one's like a big street scene and so that street scene is crazy it's like a pencil case yeah it's got the pencil case shape but it's got a post office the chemist i mean it even says chemist anymore is it british <laughs> maybe yeah. but these are all like patent pending like 1990 92 91. okay it is british swindon england okay so it's british okay so that's but it was made in chemist. china well yeah. <laughs> and so Mm-hmm. Oh, this one's got the garden one because it's swinging door. Gate door. This one has a button, but I don't, I don't know what it, it's supposed to do something when it opens or something. See that button? Uh-oh. This is the okay. castle. It's like, it opens up, there's a staircase. Yeah. And there are doors, the castle opens up. There are dogs barking. Yeah, sorry, the dogs are barking upstairs. <laughs> and, my, and my cat is interested in the Polly Pocket. Yeah, she's going to play with them. <laughs> <laughs> and the street scene, there's a restaurant, like an office. There's a car, too. Yeah, I'm, and I'm really they... jealous of the car. I had my one wedding chapel and one like here's pocket the, thing. The, um, oh, and there's a carriage. The carriage Is there the a horse? Chapel. Uh, I mean... Probably was a horse. At one time, there was a horse. Yeah. There's a little place here. You can put the carriage yeah. on. And we have all side. these yeah. little... I mean, they're microscopic. They're not even probably an inch. No. All they're the little people. tiny. Yeah. And we have yeah. one that we call Old Man Pocket. Yeah. Because he's an old man. He's old man. Old he's man bald. Pocket. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's got gray, bald head. Yeah. Uh-huh. Old man just, pocket. Yeah, old man pocket. I think he's Maybe. the lawyer in the. Oh, um, um, probably. Yeah, he's probably the lawyer. And so we got all these little pieces. Mm-hmm. And they're so funny. Uh huh. Little and, pockets. And then uh, we have the modern Polly Pocket. Yeah, which I they brought in. A new I found one. in a store and I purchased. It was on clearance. It is like, I don't know how many little Polly Pockets we have to take to equal. Let's see. let's see. Let's line them up. You need about four. It's it's about four actual Polly Pockets high. It's we'll post a picture of it. Yeah. Uh, compared to what we know as a Polly Pocket. Yeah. Um, and I'm assuming this is because small children could swallow Polly. Probably. I um, mean, we're, we're but in the age where they. Yeah, they stick everything in their mouth. That. Yeah. But when I. When I took this giant Polly out of the package, her shoes came off, and her shoes are like half the size of a little Polly Pocket, so there are still things that children could choke on. Yeah. Also, let's just analyze this. Her dress is weird. It's pink, but it's like... The skirt like, is like rubbery. It's rubbery. It's like silicone or something. It's yeah. like squishy, and her shoes are like a hard plastic, but they don't go on all the one. way. I don't know. They're like espadrilles or something. I'm not really <laughs> sure. <laughs> and her hair has like blue Pur- streaks in yeah, it. Yeah, purple streaks. But it's like, it's hard plastic. You can't play with her hair. Oh, well, her dress comes off. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can get like clothes for them. Maybe. And she has a necklace. I don't like the necklace. Is she wearing undergarments? Oh, yeah. oh this is the back. The back is open. Oh my. Oh, yeah, Polly. she is wearing at least the bottom undergarments. Your cat plays fetch. Yes, my cat plays fetch. She's so fetchy. It's strange. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, anyway. Anyway. Life of the cat. Mm. And, yeah. I mean, it's just enormous. This is not this a just, pocket. It's, it's just stupid. Like It's, it's bigger be- than... She's twice as big as the bedroom Polly Pocket set that we have. I mean, opened up. Yeah. Like, you can fit Polly in your pocket, but you can't fit her house in your pocket. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like, and she doesn't have she's, a house. Yeah. It's just, look like, the package is just her. And it doesn't look like the Polly Pocket, the original one. She's, no, she's like modern. She's got big, big eyes. It's like a Bratz doll. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's for ages four and up. Yeah. Morning small parts. 
It's from Canada. Oh. Mattel, Canada. Well, Canada, we love you, but uh, it's weird. I think you're probably bought that still in England. I'm oh, just, yeah. just children these days will never know the joy <laughs> of the, of the, the microscopic, actual poly- microscopic poly pocket. Yeah. Let's see, the cat does not care for her either. No. No. Yeah. I don't know. I just like I felt like poly pockets were like so cool. They were. They were kind of. I don't like, say necessarily ahead of their time, but uh-huh. like it was not like anything. Did you have? You know, like the Fisher Price and Weeble Wobbles. Uh-huh. Those were all really big and chunky. Polly Pockets are these tiny, tiny things. Yeah. You know, delicate. Yeah. I've always liked tiny things. I don't know, that's maybe weird, but like, no. Like miniature things. I yeah. love miniature things. I've been building a dollhouse for three years, which is a whole other story. Have you ever seen the ones at the Chicago Art Museum? Yeah. I love those. I could just spend like. Yeah. Hours staring at these rooms. Yeah. Yeah, they cleaned it a few years ago. And yeah. when they put the stuff back in, they had to wear masks because some of the items were so small they could breathe them in through their nose. Oh, wait. Yeah. 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 I mean, that makes <laughs> sense. But... Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do with this pod pocket. Mm. Maybe she can be like our mascot. Yeah. She's got, <gasps> she has a lower back tattoo. It's okay. like a, a stamp of some sort of serial number or something, but it looks like a tramp stamp. <laughs> I was like, does she really? Oh. Yeah, she really does. She's yeah. a tramp stamp. <laughs> it's random numbers. But, you know, maybe it means something to her. Maybe. Probably. It does. It does. I'm sure it's like Mr. Pocket's birthday or something. Yeah. Well, I suppose his last name isn't Pocket. I don't know. Is her last name Pocket? How does this work? <laughs> okay, yeah, I don't, I don't know. We have old man pocket. Old man pocket. Old man pockets are bombing. Oh, so yeah. There's a boy, boy pocket. Boy pocket. There's well, yeah. Pockets. You can tell he's a boy because he's wearing a baseball hat. Yeah. Here's the husband pocket. <laughs> Mr. Pocket. <laughs> Mr. Pocket. <laughs> oh, I think he's a prince. Prince pocket. Oh. See, her shoe fell off. It, it doesn't stay on. <laughs> They're too tiny. They are. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like the 90s were a great time for toys because, like, all of this really great stuff just came out, like, appeared. And yeah. Now I feel like toys are weird. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe the kids like them. Yeah. <laughs> um, the young whippersnappers and yeah. the new fun dangle toys that aren't fun. Yeah. At least it's yeah. I, I am jealous of this set. We'll, we'll take pictures. And yeah. Post on our social medias. So which we will tell you about. We do have... An Instagram site, and we have a Facebook. Facebook, and we I think we I have Twitter as well. You have a Twitter, so we're, <laughs> we're gonna start rolling those out mm-hmm. to all you tens of fans listening. All the people all listening. The people. Yeah. Which right now Shout is, out to our two friends. Yeah. We love you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, thanks guys. Thanks for support. <laughs> okay. So yeah. there's there's Polly Pocket. Polly Pocket. Uh-huh. And all of her. Glory, you know, or something. Gigantic Polly Pocket. I don't know. Okay. So now that we've talked about the Polly Pockets that we've talked for, talked about for months. Yes. We're going to go on to a show. It used to be very popular in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Most of you probably know it. It's uh-huh. full of beach buddies and... Had the greatest theme song. Yes. Ever. Yes. If I could sing. do 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 yeah. I don't know, start something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then had David Hasselhoff uh, running. That was, to me, that's the epic Hasselhoff. I don't, uh-huh. you know, visualize anything else. Right. Not the, Did he do anything? Oh, Knight Rider. Yeah, Knight Rider. Yeah. I didn't know Knight Rider, but. No, I don't know. Baywatch. So. Yeah. We're talking about Baywatch. Baywatch. I uh-huh. think, in my mind, we, as a family, always watched it. Like, that was one of our evening shows we mm-hmm. watched together. You know, my sister and I, we just love swimming, so we enjoyed the swimming part. And I always loved when they had to, like, dive in the water and, like, do that weird, like, dolphin yeah. archy thing <laughs> that they have to do. Yeah. And so. I, I remember watching it as a child. I don't know if we all watched it together. Or, I don't know. But I've been rewatching it lately. Yeah. Because it's on Hulu. Oh. I, oddly enough, was waiting for it to be streamable somewhere because I yeah. wanted to watch it. And so I've been rewatching it. I made it through the first season. Did you know that in the first season, Hobie, Mitch's son, yeah. is played by Brandon Call, who was JT on Step by Step. 
No, I didn't. But only in the first season. Only in the first and he's like, he's like 13 years old yeah. in the first season. And he, he was really good at it. Like, I thought it was pretty good. But in season two, yeah. they recast him. He's, um. he's played by Jeremy Jackson, who was like a heartthrob. Okay. But he's 10 years old in season two. So oh. they, they made him younger and they recast him. Oh, well, that's disappointing. Yeah. I was gonna ask if it is it as good as you remember. Oh yeah. Better? Yeah. Oh, it's it's still <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my sister and I been watching it, and she was like, "Why is there a crime in every episode? Because it's like all these." I <laughs> I keep meaning to ask our friend who's from California, like, does this really happen? Like, because I know it doesn't. Yeah. But like, there are all these crazy no crimes crime on the beach. Was such yeah. A thing. I didn't know there were so many bombs in the ocean. <laughs> like, <laughs> why is everything exploding? Because <laughs> it's like seriously, like, yeah. every episode something crazy goes down, and maybe that's just the first season. Because yeah. it seems like in the second season it's toned down a little bit on the crime, and they're maybe showing a little more skin in the okay. second season. So lowering yeah. the crime and upping the skin. Yeah, they also recast quite a few people between season one and season two, mm. and just like got rid of some characters, and there's no explanation for where they went. Well, of course. I always saw the women in those really high cut yeah. swimsuits and just gorgeous, and uh-huh. I thought, oh, that's what the, the girls <laughs> look like. And I'm like, oh, you're yeah. that pretty. That was. You know, yeah, it is kind of unrealistic expectation. Oh, yeah. Bad body image. <laughs> I wonder why we have such bad body image. Well, because, like, think of all of the people. You remember the names of, like, Pamela Anderson was on there, and yeah. Yasmin Bleeth, and I can't remember who else. And, like, you don't remember the names of, of the guys, necessarily. Yeah. Brooke Burke. Yeah. Um, it was, like, our our idols at yeah. the time, and they really weren't very good actresses, I don't no, think. I like, think about where they are that. now. I think Brooke Burke might have done some Hallmark movies. Didn't she marry uh, da- David Charvet? Who was was it, was it he on? Being yeah, Watch? he was okay, on Baywatch Watch too. Yeah, yeah. I think they might be divorced. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna double check that. I don't want to be broadcasting. Sadly, I would wouldn't be surprised. Because well, right. Part of marriages. Yeah, right. Just, it is unrealistic. Yeah, they're Even divorced. The, okay. They they filed for divorce. Not mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So. But yeah, it's a trip, and I've told some people that I've been rewatching Baywatch, and they make fun of me. No, did it's... you watch the new movie with The Rock and Zac? Yeah, it was awful. Well, I love The Rock and Zac Efron, but yeah. I just had no desire to watch that because I could just tell it was like a parody of Baywatch. Yeah. It's... And maybe if they like, I knew they were kind of cheesing it up and kind of oh, yeah. hokey wise, but oh, yeah. they flat out said it was a parody kind of. Okay. Yeah. Because that's the thing about the show, like, it's not a parody. Like, yeah. they are serious about the storylines they're telling. Like, yeah. they're not trying to make it hokey. It is hokey, but they weren't trying to be hokey. Yeah. Like, they were trying to be serious about it. So, it, the movie just, it's awful. Yeah. It's, uh, it's all, it's just like a satire of the show. And it, I don't think it did very well at the box office. No, so. I don't think so. Yeah. Either. Sorry, Rock and uh, yeah, Zach. Yeah, sorry, I Zach. Guys, but... Zach, I still love you. Oh, I love Zach and Rock. And oh, in the Greatest Showman. Yeah. When he started singing. Yeah. Oh. I do love. I love Zach and Rock. Not since High School Musical because that is past my time. Uh huh. Because I was older when that thing came out, but in Hairspray. Yeah. Was a, you know, I saw oh, he was a singer, mm-hmm. and so I took notice of him. I was just like, oh, it's that guy. And, uh-huh. you know, I was yeah. really happy to see him in The Greatest Showman because he really he can't can do it all. He's, he's very a, talented. He's a great singer, and I wish he would do more. Yeah. Musical parts. I mean, I guess like, there's not much. I don't yeah. Know, still, it's not where the money is. No. It's a waste of talent. He yeah. can dance too. I know. He's a triple threat. Yeah. Sing, Dance, act. Yeah. Yeah. Look gorgeous. Look gorgeous. Look mm. gorgeous. Yeah. See how the conversation has devolved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and hence our point of the podcast. Okay. Uh-huh. So Zach and the Rock, we love you, but we're gonna have to pass this one. Yeah. Okay. Now we're gonna go on to our rants portion, and rants are gonna be whatever you know is bugging us in society, in the literary library world. Mm-hmm. Our personal lives. I mean, just 
Whatever, it's going to be all in sundry in the yeah. ranting section. Okay, so, Kyla, what's your first rant? Okay, so my first rant is, there was a story, and it's from November, but it's regarding Sarah Dessen. Yes. Who is considered, like, the queen of young adult romance, although she'd probably be offended that I just called her a romance author. Because oh. apparently she's easily offended. But she's fluffy. And it's fluffy. It's fluffy. It's a romance story. We we tried yes. one for book club and there was nothing to talk about because yeah. we were all like, well, that's cute. So in November, this article came out that there was a student at a South Dakota university. And let's see, it's Northern State University in South Dakota. And there was an article in the local news there, so in this whatever small town in South Dakota, about how the university had like a freshman read. Like yeah. a book that they encourage every first year student to read. They want to read idea. the same book. And there was a student who was on the committee to pick the books. And she said she decided she wanted to be on the committee to keep them from choosing a book by Sarah Dessen. Quote, she's fine for teen girls, but definitely not up to the level of common read. So I became involved simply so I could stop them from ever choosing Sarah Dessen. End quote. Which is a little harsh. But kind of valid. Yeah, I can't say I disagree with her. Yeah. So anyway, this small town newspaper publishes this article that's not about Sarah Dessen. It's about this common read. But then Sarah Dessen sees it and authors, other authors see it. And Sarah Dessen like takes offense. Authors are real people. We put our heart and soul into the stories we write often because it is literally how we survive in this world. I'm having a really hard time right now. And this is just mean and cruel. I hope it made you feel good. So, I mean, it devolved from there. Lots of other well-known authors like Roxane Gay and other people came to the defense of Sarah Dessen. And like, how could you say these mean things about her? Um, your writing is so good. You're such a good author. Authors are real people. Blah, blah, blah. And I think I mean, even Jodi Bacolt got involved. Like, how, why are you getting involved? So I think like there's something to be said here about like the power of the influence of authors yeah and especially young adult authors because yeah. the people using social media are younger people mm-hmm. and so i think i think they could have just left this one alone yeah i don't think it required a response no because the girl at the university wasn't knocking sarah dessa she just wanted something a little higher plot line higher something with more meat to it yeah or this university Read. Yeah. It's not like she said Sarah Dessen's awful. She shouldn't write. I think Sarah yeah. Dessen overreacted, and her followers and the authors just jumped on the bag and wagon without reading the story and mm-hmm. thinking, thinking before they replied. And yeah. I feel bad for this girl who just wanted to elevate the reading for the freshmen in front of class. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, even the university issued an apology to Sarah Dessen. Like, I feel like you're going to get a lot of criticism as an author, and you probably already have received a lot of yeah. criticism. And do you just get to the point where everyone thinks you're wonderful, and so you start to think that everything you do is wonderful? And I don't know, Sarah Dessen's probably going to tweet at us after this. But. That's fine. Tweet at us. Tweet at us, we don't care. But I, you know, I think there are a lot of authors who are very aware of their their social media presence. Several years ago, like ten years ago, probably when social media was just really getting going, Meg Cabot, Libba Bray, and Maggie Steve Otter did a tour together mm-hmm. for Scholastic, and they were chosen because they had really good social media presences at the at that time, and so it was a way to connect them with their readers in the real world because they were already connected online. And in fact, when I got up to Maggie Stiebotter in the signing line, she said, do I know you from the internet? And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I don't know. I just think you need to be more aware of your power. Yeah. And it can get a little out of hand. Yeah. And yes, we know authors are people too, but people are people too. End rant. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Do you want me to do my second rant or do you want to rant first? Um, go ahead with your second rant. You're okay. Kind of, kind of it's, part of it's, it's, my um, rant. Yeah. So my rant is... Fine free libraries, is that the one yeah. that I do? So there's this, the Chicago Public Library recently announced that they were going to go fine free. And there are a couple of problems with this. One is the whole concept of fine free, that it's not, it doesn't really mean that you're never going to be punished for not returning your materials on time. What it means is that you're not going to get late fees if your book is a couple days late. If you lose your book, 
if you never return it, mm -hmm. if you spill a cup of coffee on it, you're still going to be charged for the cost of that book. That's how Chicago's doing it, and I think that's generally when people do find free. That's how they do it. And people have been wanting, have been talking about it in relation to our library, and I just, I don't know, I'm really hesitant about it because I don't think you're going to get the results you think you are. The yeah. idea is open access. The idea is a kid who has a bunch of late books um, okay. can't use their library card. They yeah. can't check more books out. But what we see in our community, and it's a pretty diverse community with pretty broad socioeconomic differences, yeah. You see a lot of parents using their children's library card to check out, like, a ton of movies, and then they don't return them, and so they have hundreds of dollars of lost fees on their yeah. card. The kid can't use their card, but it's not their fault. It's the parent's fault. Going fine free isn't going to solve that. No. And, and I don't know. I just, unless you give me, like, really good research why it's a good idea, I don't want to do it. It's a good idea in theory, but not in practice. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are a lot of, you know, kids that have, you know, even kids that have grown up to be teenagers or adults that their parents have checked out, they've ruined their accounts at the library, and, mm -hmm. you know, our hands are kind of tied, but like you said, find free is not going to fix that. Yeah. Because we can't have a lot of material checked out and never returned. I mean, yeah. there's people with major and it's usually the non-print stuff. Yeah. It's it's CDs, DVDs, audiobooks that are going to get yeah. that. And we can't make people be responsible. This is not going to force them to be responsible. So I don't know. I don't think it's the answer. That's I don't just think my opinion. Fine free is not is not the answer. Maybe more amnesty days. Yeah. Because I know there's a couple times where they we've done amnesty and like bring in a can good for the uh, local food pantry yeah, or food whatever. Pantry uh -huh. And get like 50 cents off per can or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. No. But you didn't wipe all out the like collections, the fines over $25 or whatever. So fine free is not the answer. People are going to get fines or not return their items no matter what. You know, so it just yeah, it's not the answer. I don't think so. I mean, I would be interested to see how Chicago is, you know, like six months after they implemented yeah. the fine free. Have they, mm -hmm. are they happy with it? Are they going to revert? It, yeah. It would be interesting to see. It's a good yeah. idea in theory. And, like, libraries aren't fining you because we need money. We need money. That's that's not yeah. false. But we're not finding people because we need money. It's, yeah, that's it's such just a small part it's, of our budget. I mean, libraries can't take an income. We're tax supported. It's yeah. we're not looking for income. If you want to support the friends of the library, that's a good way to support your library yeah. monetarily. But it's a drop in the bucket to us from fines. So that's that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because we want the materials back so that other people can enjoy them. And that's not gonna solve the issue. Mm -mm. You know, people are still gonna check out and not return the things we want. And you know, case by case on the kids who have gone to teens now, you know, or young adults and they wanna mm -hmm. Hard, but yeah, there have been times where we could see that the parent is librarians make that judgment call, and maybe they can be more lax in the judgment call. Yeah, and yeah. we we're not monsters. We make exceptions for yeah. people. Not everyone, certainly, but if we see what the situation really is and that yeah. it's not the child's fault, we're gonna try to help you out. So fine there's free there's my fine free idea. Idea, theory, but yeah, yeah, I don't think it's for us. Okay, so my rant is about the new New York Public Library in Brooklyn or Queens. Long Island? Long Island. One of, the, <laughs> one of the boroughs, but New York City, where it is not readily handicap accessible. There's one elevator, and that's jam-packed always with, like, parents wanting to get to the children's department. Uh, and, like, backlog of stroller parking. Yeah, and, it's, and the fiction is on these, like, tiers. Like, that stairs. Can, yeah, these stairs, tiers kind of thing that you can get to level one and two in the library, but not farther up. And I'm just dumbfounded at how the building built, built and they spent years, I mean, like, ten years planning yeah. this, building this. It, it costs like forty-one million dollars. Yeah, just ridiculous. $41 million dollars. One small elevator to minimal parts of the library, and how do you, I, I don't get? I don't get it. I don't get how they could just very obviously mm -hmm. miss a great part of their population: the handicapped, the disabled, yeah. wheelchair-bound, 
strollers. I, I don't get it. I mean, elderly people yeah. who just have trouble walking Why? up and down stairs. It's ridiculous. It's fucking ridiculous. That's the swear word, but you know it is. I mm-hmm. and at what point did somebody say, "Oh, we need more accessibility"? Because I know there are people in our small-ish that go up and down the elevator because we can't. We had a former coworker who was very heavily reliant on his walker, so he can go down up and down stairs. And he, had, I just don't get it. And mm-hmm. we have help, you know, unhealthy mm-hmm. people who have medical problems that can't walk well on the stairs. This and is it just Long Island City, Long I guess. Island. It's technically Queens. A staircase and bleacher seating in the children's section was judged too risky for small children, so it was closed off. Yeah. And then the the fiction section is on these terrace. The fiction, you put your fiction on there, and it just opened in September. And yeah. they said, well, so maybe a patron can't get up there, but they can talk to a librarian, and the librarian can go fetch it. A, mm-hmm. that's not a good use of the librarian, and B, have they never heard of browsing? Right. I mean, a lot of people, especially in the fiction, browse the shelves. They don't really go one straight author. You know, if they want a specific book or an author, they're going to ask for it, put it on hold or whatever. But Mm -hmm. the majority of the time, people browse the sections. Yeah. You can't, can't, if you can't get to them. It's five floors. It has one elevator. And only one of the terrace levels of of the fiction is accessible by the elevator. It's, I don't know. It looks beautiful. Yeah, it looks beautiful. And it's like they've been sending people there to see the views of the city because yeah. it's like architecturally like really cool, which is all well and good, but it's a public space. It's a library. Yeah. Um, it has to be accessible to everyone. Yeah. This is, and a, this is such a big. This is a New York Times article from November. It says the disputed shelves are now bare. They moved the fiction to an accessible area on the second floor, and they're figuring out how to use the vacated space. So well, that's two just months a waste after of they time open, time and resources and money that you, I mean, it could have been easily solved if you added a few more elevators and re, yeah, ways to get. What architect in their right mind did this? It's ridiculous. Yeah, it is ridiculous. And so, Rant. Sorry, New York Public Library, but that was wrong. $41 million. $41 million. Because yeah. that, like, 500000 more had a couple more elevators that reached every floor and we wouldn't have had this problem. Or just turn those terraces into ramps. Like, yeah. can they do that? Like, yeah. uh, whatever, yeah. whatever. Yeah, it shouldn't have gone to this point. Uh, end rant. End rant. We're going to end our podcast on just general news. Something, something that makes us happy. So that we don't end on a rant. Yeah. What about Baby Yoda? Carla is a huge, huge Star Wars fan. I am. And they've had the last movie. Yeah. And Mandalorian's been out. It's been uh-huh. gone. Yeah. And Baby Yoda is taking the internet by storm. I love him. And, oh my god, so do I. He's really cute. A coworker, a coworker at one of our branches the other day said, "Was there a Baby Yoda in the new Star Wars?" I don't watch them, but I saw a picture and I saw it explained yeah. about him, and she was like, "Well, he's adorable." Uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know how our lives functioned without Baby Yoda. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's parents who say, "I don't know, I don't remember my life before my child." It's like, <laughs> I, like I don't remember my life before Baby Yoda. How did we function? Yeah. I don't know. He just brings so much joy. Yes. His face and the gifts and his the memes. Giant like, eyes. I know. Yeah. I've been Baby. saving pictures to my phone just yeah. so I have them. Yeah. Is that weird? No. Okay, thank you. Not weird. I saw a, um, it's not really an advertisement, but an ad for leggings that had Baby Yoda on them. Oh my gosh. And I, was like, I may have bought a bootleg t shirt with Baby Yoda like coming out of your pocket. Oh. I don't have it yet, but I bought it. <laughs> in, th- in theory. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've seen one where it's about reading. I don't remember where it was, but it was Baby Yoda and reading, and I was like, oh, oh I know. I could just stare at Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda hour. also brings us pain. So Personal pain. <laughs> yeah, personal pain. <laughs> so my. My boss sent me, uh, well, tagged me in a Facebook post that another library had figured out that they could 3D print a Baby Yoda, and I have a 3D printer in my office that we got for free. It was like one of those things where you order X amount of books, and they sent you a 3D printer, and then we were like, 
what do we do with this? So it's just in my office. So I printed a, a baby Yoda and you have to print it with supports because his ears stick out. And if they just start printing in the open air, they'll fall. They need something yeah. to print on. So then after it finishes, you cut the supports off. So I'm sitting at my desk holding baby Yoda in my left hand with an X-Acto knife in my right hand. And the knife slipped and went into my left index finger. And fast forward to me laying on the floor with my feet up on my chair my boss getting the first aid kit. Thank you, Alice. Um, and bandaging my finger. And then I went to first care to get a tetanus shot. And they did this whole thing where they had to like clean it out. And then they put steri strips on it. They billed me for surgery. Oh. Okay. And, and then, what? <laughs> right. Yeah. That's what it said on the, on the explanation of benefits. It's surgery. So oh. I turned it into worker's comp. <laughs> <laughs> technically i mean but picture me going to prompt care and you check in at the desk and they're like so how'd you do this yeah. <laughs> well i 3d printed a baby yoda i didn't say it i yeah. was like well it was cutting something with exacto knife and by like the third or fourth person who asked me i was like it was a baby yoda if that matters <laughs> like <laughs> do you need to write all of this down can you sue disney <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, I didn't really have the rights to print the baby over no. in the first place. Whatever. So then I was telling my family and they decided that my boss instructed me to 3D yeah. print this baby Yoda. So oh, it's her yeah. fault. Sorry, Alice. <laughs> but I, I don't have feeling in my finger right above the cut. And I'm going to have probably a scar for the rest of my life. So baby Yoda. Baby Yoda. He brings us joy. He brings us pain. <laughs> I'm sure there's a gif or a meme out there that is an appropriate reaction shot to his face being sad or yeah. shocked that I might have one on my phone. Probably <laughs> caused you pain. Uh -huh. So baby Yoda. Baby Yoda. I think that's a good one to end on. I think so. Because baby Yoda is just everything. Should I post my finger to social media? Yeah. I have some right have after. The, okay. I have you some have graphic the picture photos. of the baby Yoda print? I don't, but I can oh, take one. Okay. It's on my desk at work. Yeah. So people can <laughs> see what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys for listening to, I don't know what this is, but it's our podcast. If okay. anyone is still listening. Yeah. <laughs> and we enjoyed it, and we hope you enjoy it, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to our random thoughts and musings. Join us next time for more unpredictable conversations. Thanks to all our supporters. Music credit, Fuzzball Parade, Kevin McLeod, and Competech.com. License under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 License. HTTP colon forward slash forward slash creativecommons.org forward slash licenses forward slash by forward slash 4.0 forward slash.